Okay, so now we'll go ahead and get started. And thank you so much for coming out. This is our first prayer meeting since early March or since early mid-March uh, right in there. So thank you so much for coming out. Um, if you don't have a prayer sheet, um, there should be one at least on the table close to you. And hopefully over the coming weeks, we'll, we'll grow back together. Um, we're going to start um, with a word of prayer. And then, of course, Pastor Chris is going to lead us in some singing. Um, each week, I'm going to record at least the, the lesson portion of it. We don't want to put all the prayer requests online. Um, some of those can be very private. So we will at least get the lesson portion of this to be put online uh, for each evening for those that can't be here. Um, but again, thank you so much for coming out, and I pray that it's a blessing to you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for giving us another opportunity once again, Lord, after three months to come back together. Lord, I know many of us, we've been praying in our own homes. We've been studying. Uh, Lord, we've been with our families and those that we love. And Lord, we just pray today that as we uh, come to this time of prayer and of uh, praise and study of your word, that Lord, we would think of those in our world who are most affected. Lord, we think of those in our country who are under the gun, literally. They are facing some difficult times. Uh, Lord, we think of our president and our governor. Lord, all those in uh, the cities, Lord, who are leading. Pray, Lord, for our police and law enforcement. And, Lord, we do think of our missionaries who are uh, across the world, Lord, that you would be with them as they minister in some difficult places. Now, Lord, today, bless your word. May our praise um, truly come from a heart that is thankful and, uh, and just ready to receive what you have for us. And, Lord, we ask all these things in your name. Amen. Okay, so if you have your prayer sheet, you can turn that over and turn to Acts 17. So this is our Bible study. We're going to be going through um, the letters to the church at Thessalonica, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, but we're going to be starting, of course, with um, Acts 17, which is where the story of this church originates. And our study, of course, as we look at um, this particular lesson, deals with end times, deals with staying on course um, during difficult times and trusting the Lord. And if we could put it one way, it's staying on course when the road is rough. And I think that's something that we can all relate to. So the title today is Neither Rain Nor Sleet Nor Snow. And our key verse is Psalm 36 verse 5. And you can put your finger there in Acts 17. And if you want to look at Psalm 36 verse 5, uh, you can, but I'll read it to you. This is what it says here. David writes, Thy mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens, and thy faithfulness reacheth unto the clouds. Um, so this lesson really is talking about the faithfulness of God, but really it's dealing with our faithfulness when we experience hard times. And I think we're living proof right now. This is what's going on. Uh, the road is very rough. Um, but even though the road is rough, God is faithful. Uh, so let's look at our introduction, and then after that we'll read uh, Acts 17, verses 1 through 10. So whether you're inching down the road, racing at high speeds, or driving normally, it's easy to get off course or to get off the road. Impatience with bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic might have you taking the first exit, and then you are off course. Coming back and forth with my mom's illness, um, they stopped you at the border of Florida, and driving up, uh, there was at one point about a six mile long, uh, it wasn't standstill, but it was far. And I thought to myself, when we come back, I'm not going to get caught up there. And we got off um, way before it was around Brunswick, and we just went through the back way. And there was no one out there but um, dead rodents, uh, you know, and a few pickup trucks. That was about it, and a lot of trees. But we can get off course very easily. If you hit a patch of ice, which you're not going to do in Florida, your car can spin out of control, and once again, you are off course. Or if you're driving too fast, you can lose control and end up in a ditch, which again is off course. Even if you're taking your time driving carefully, unforeseen circumstances can have you off course in a minute. 
And life is the same way. Weren't we kind of just going about our year, early March? Do you even remember early March? And one Sunday it was fine. We heard it in the news. We saw what was going on in China. And then all of a sudden we're in the ditch for three months. Um, and, it, and it happened so fast. For the believers who received the letters um, of First and Second Thessalonians, it was persecution trying to knock them off course. Satan did not want them leading or living godly lives. He wanted to discourage and disable them to get off course. He was doing everything he could within his power to knock them off. So Paul wrote to them, reinforcing what they already knew, clarifying what they were unsure of, and encouraging them in doing well. He said, this is what you've got to do when hard times come. Um, it's interesting, we all learn to drive at a young age, but until you're in a certain situation, you don't know your reaction time, whether it be in um, hurricane-type weather, whether it's downpours or even driving in snow and black ice. And the reaction time, knowing how you're going to react all of those things you've learned uh, kick in, and we, we kind of grab the wheel. We do what we are trained to do. In short, Paul is aiming to help keep them on track in their spiritual lives. Satan's trying to knock them off. Truths like the imminent return of Christ lifted their heavy hearts and sharpened their focus. If anything, for us, as we're going to see this, the return of Christ even makes what we're going through not, I won't say so much better, but it, it causes us to look beyond what we're dealing with to say, Lord, I'm ready. You know, I'm, I, want, I want you to come. I want you to fix things. And we know He will do that. Despite persecution and Satan's attempts, this church stayed on course. And so the whole lesson, the main theme of what we're going to go through over these weeks is going to be, don't let Satan force you off the road. We hear it so often. It's that way in Greenville. It's in Keystone. Uh, I was up in Jacksonville yesterday. People are crazy. One guy even, as we we're driving, he just swerved out. There was no one there. My wife and I had to hit the brakes on the highway. He just came out and almost hit our front bumper. He was I was going 65. He could have caused a terrible accident, I mean, within inches. Satan wants to force you and I. He wants to force Christians off the road of spiritual progress. He wants us to be knocked down. And ultimately, He can't kill us, our soul that is. He can't take us to hell, but He wants to bring hell to us. He wants to make sure that our lives do not resemble the Lord Jesus Christ. So Paul wrote this letter to this church to help keep them on the path. So Acts chapter 17 uh, let's look at this. And this is the origination. This is where it all began. Uh, chapter 17 of Acts, verses 1 through 10. Now when they had passed through Amphilius and Apollyana, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days, so three weeks, reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. Well, what did he use? He used the Torah, the Old Testament, the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ, or here's the Messiah, the Son of God. And some believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks a great multitude, and of the chief women not a few. There were a lot of important people. There were a great multitude of People who believe, but the Jews, which believe not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort. We're seeing that in the news. That's what these people are. They're lewd people of the baser sort. They gathered a company, which is basically what you see is a mob. That's the, the translation. And set all the city on an uproar, a riot, and assaulted the house of Jason, which was a convert, and sought to bring them out to the people. So they wanted to get Paul and Silas, this man where Paul and Silas had been staying. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren under the rulers of the city, crying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. 
What a great accusation. They've turned everything upside down. So not the people setting things on fire. It's the ones who have given their lives to Christ. Whom Jason hath received, all these do contrary to the decrees of Caesar. They're treasonous. They, they, their crime is not Christianity, they're saying. Their crime is treason. Saying that there's another king, one Jesus. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. So they basically created a riot. And when they had taken security or a bond of Jason and of the other, they let them go. So they took this bond from them. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea. And of course, we see they did that for their protection. Who coming thither, so when Paul and Silas arrived in Berea, they went into the synagogue of the Jews which is a pretty great thing. Yeah, that's awesome. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, and let's ask Him to bless as we look this morning. Dear Lord, today, thank You so much for Your Word. And now, Lord, help us as we open it briefly to understand uh, we're living in these same days. And Lord, these disciples, these men, these women uh, were accused of turning the world upside down. And Lord, may that be the same thing that we... Lord, could wear in our own lives that because of the way we're living, because of the way that we're acting, because of the way that we're loving people, that, Lord, uh, this world would look at us and see that there's something different. And, Lord, we are strangers. We are pilgrims. We're only passing through. So, Lord, give us boldness. And, Lord, teach us Your Word by Your Spirit. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So look down at the overview of First and Second Thessalonians. So, though they had just experienced persecution in Philippi, Paul and Silas traveled to Thessalonica. They had just come from a place where they were thrown out, basically. Persecution. Then, after many put their trust in Christ, they again faced opposition from the Jews. But instead of quitting, they continued to minister. And so they left a core group of believers in Thessalonica, and they moved to Berea. So the theme here for us is faithful believers do not quit ministering in the face of opposition. They don't quit. They don't think of it this way. When you have had a flat tire on your car or something has happened or occurred, do you just leave the car and never return to it? When there's a problem and you're off the road in the ditch, no, it takes some work to get it out, but you... You work at it, you work on it, and you get back to where you're supposed to be and down the road. So think about the mailman, the mailwoman, the mail carrier, and how they are supposed to deliver the mail in all kinds of weather. And we've seen, of course, that even in recent days, they've said for UPS, FedEx, Amazon to not go deliver packages in certain cities. You're seeing trucks being raided. But we understand that they are supposed to deliver the mail in all kinds of weather. They go to work in rain, sleet, snow, whatever. Well, what would happen if the mail carriers only delivered the mail on days that they thought were nice? Or, you know what, on nice days we're not going to show up because you get to go to the beach, why can't we? We're going we're gonna to enjoy ourselves. So spiritually, what would happen if Christians served God only when it was convenient for them or when things were easy? It's not easy often to be a believer, but Jesus said, take up your cross. So despite the difficulty, Paul and Silas were faithful to God to preach the gospel. They did not give up and run. Um, My friend Dan Schaefer, he grew up in Jacksonville. Um, His dad was a professor, one of my mentors. He's a pastor in Queens. And on Sunday night, he shared on Facebook, that's all right, he shared on Facebook that... um, They were rioting. They were having the groups come by his church, by their homes. And he was asking for prayer, saying, We need to, um, we're living on the front lines here. Well, think of the Christians here. Um, There are some that are in harm's way on the mission field. Um, This past week, one of our missionaries that was on the slide, um, I met him five years ago when they came, and he has a ministry in a Muslim country. He doesn't give out prayer cards. We can't show it online because of where he's at. He's covert. Well, some are right there in harm's way, and they do not give up and run. These men and women, they continue to be faithful in their calling to serve God, and so must we. 
We have to be faithful. So only three points this morning, and then we're going to look at these verses. So first of all, Paul preached in Thessalonica and in the synagogue. Look at verses 1 through 4 in chapter 17, and you'll see that. Uh, so Thessalonica was the second largest city in Macedonia, and it was the capital city. So let's, let's think of us living in Tallahassee. Uh, we as uh, as a church, as a group of people, let's say that we're there right now. So this particular uh, city where they're preaching is the capital city. What do most capital cities carry with them? It's a difficult place to minister. It's a very political place. It's a it's a very populated place. It's this is where they have gone. And Paul and Silas visited the city on his second missionary journey, and while there, he preached Jesus. He went into the synagogue and he preached Jesus Christ. So the Jews who, along with the Romans, were responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus, he went into the very place and said, this Jesus that you crucified is the Messiah. And of course it landed him in trouble. This is something that Paul constantly found himself in. But Paul was faithful to the message of the gospel and did not compromise it. Well, Paul and Silas did not cave even when they faced opposition. Paul's faithfulness to the gospel represented his faithfulness to the Lord. That's it. He said, Lord, I'm going to be faithful to you, and this is what you've told me to do. So I don't care what I'm facing. I'm going to stand up. I'm going to do what's right. Those who believe the gospel became part of those who formed this particular church. So you still see this in verses 1 through 4. They came in verse number 1 to Thessalonica. There was a synagogue. Paul preached for three weeks, reasoning with them out of the Scriptures, which is exactly the only thing that we have. He showed them Christ from the Old Testament and how that what Jesus went through, this was the Messiah, and that there were a number, verse 4, a number of devout Greeks Um, and chief women, and there were a whole lot of them that believed. So note here, we may not struggle with adding to the gospel. We're not going to add to the gospel. You don't have to go through Mary to approach Jesus. You don't have to go through the church to approach Jesus. You don't have to go through your good works to approach Jesus. You don't have to go through your money. Um, But here, we can see that we might not struggle with adding to the gospel, but do we struggle with sharing it? Maybe our struggle is not, well, telling people because of pressure, you got to do this and you got to do this, but do we even share it? Um, We cannot claim to be faithful followers of Jesus if we do not share the gospel, if we're not just telling people the bridge is out. Okay, there's a problem coming. The the road runs out at the cliff, and if you don't stop, you're going to go over the cliff. You need to avoid this. Well, Paul and Silas, they were faithful and in so much that they went into the mouth of the lion's den. They went to the very places where they were hated the most. You've seen what's going on in our nation and in the past, in history. Jim Elliott and those men, they lost their lives while trying, attempting to share the gospel and to make a connection with these Indians, these people in this remote uh, part of the world, and they were slain, they were killed. It doesn't mean that Christ may call us to a remote village somewhere obscure in the world, but can we be faithful to minister and to share the Word of God here, share it online, to share it with those that we know, even in our families? So not only, number one, Paul preached um, in Thessalonica in the synagogue. Number two, Paul was persecuted. So preaching often is preceded by persecution. So look at verses 5 through 9. We see this here. Some heard the gospel, actively rejected it, and plotted against Paul and Silas. There's always a response to the truth. It's never neutral. The Bible says this, that we shouldn't cast our pearl before swine, but that God's word does not return void, meaning there is a response to truth. And it's not my truth, and we're hearing that today. I don't want to live my truth. I want to share my truth. I'm going to, well, it's not my truth or your truth. What is the truth? What is truth? Even Pilate asked Jesus, what is truth? The world is crying out for truth. Not truth that is inflicted at the hands of an angry mob, 
but truth that comes from the loving hand of Christ, but one day will come down as the judge of all the world. So Paul and Silas, the message was rejected by this group, and because of their strong negative feelings against Paul, here's how we put it, the Jews, the synagogue, it says, they employed a group of unemployed slackers, a bunch of people who were loafers, who then formed a mob and cited them against Paul and Silas and the new church. You can see that in verses 5 through 9. Verse 5, the Jews which believe not moved with envy. They hated this. Well, why were they envious? Well, they had a following. They were following Paul and Silas as they follow Christ. So this resulted in turmoil or a riot throughout the city as the mob rioted. That's what they did in going after Paul and Silas. They showed this crowd, showed that they were willing to violate the law to get what they wanted. Now again, this message is not in response to, it's just where we're going in First and Second Thessalonians, but the response of the gospel was a riot. Reasons, But this reason here in Acts 17 was because they had preached the gospel and now the, the riots began and they went after them. So note here, sin always indicates faithfulness to self rather than to God. The, this group of people, they were in sin because they're like, I'm doing what I want to do and I don't care who it hurts. As long as it doesn't hurt me, I don't mind hurting other people. <laughs> doesn't that sound like where we're at today? But the base of this was because they had been preaching the gospel. What does our world need? They need the gospel. They need Jesus. And Jesus is, and God's word is being interjected into this, but at the base of it, at the root of it, the gospel, the, the life changing message of Jesus is exactly what this world needs. And that's what is so evidently missing. They were accused then of turning the world upside down. Well, who had actually done that? That was the mob. That was the synagogue of, this, of the Jews. That were the rioters. They were the ones lighting things on fire, chasing these Christians down. It was Nero who crucified Christians all throughout the streets who burned them at his parties, stuck them on a pole, would tar them, and burn them. You think of how Christians during this day truly faced opposition, and Paul was here being accused of turning the world upside down. The message of the gospel always has a response, even if it's negative. No matter how long we preach it or share it, there will be a response. And no response is a response. No response is a response. So they said, you're turning the world upside down and you are treasonous. Have we not heard that even recently? As we look at this day here, because they had preached the gospel in this particular city and people were converted, they were saved, they were delivered from their wicked lifestyle and turned their lives over to Christ, the mob said, I don't think so. And they were accused of turning the world upside down and of treason, which is a charge that they knew would maybe stick when the other charge wouldn't. Oh, so you're saying there's another king. So you follow Jesus, this, this crucified one, and not King Caesar. So the believers were finally released. They were brought in to the magistrates, we see, but it would cost them. They said there was a security or like a bond, which if you meet certain stipulations... You can get out, and if you violate certain stipulations, you can lose that. So this particular disciple, his name is Jason, with the group of believers, they released them, but it cost them. So note here, faithfulness to the Lord can be costly when viewed from an earthly perspective. And many people who don't know the Lord or who are living um, apart from the Lord that once knew the Lord, they're like, why would you do this? Why would you... Why, why do you go to church? Why would you give to missions? Why would you why do you live like this? They don't understand the cost involved in following Jesus, but there is a cost. And that's why many people 
Don't walk the narrow path. What is the narrow path? Well, that's the one that leads to salvation. And few, few there be that find it. And that's not a popular message. We see here that it costs something to be a follower of Jesus. And yet the world looks at it and says, I'm not willing to pay that price. It costs the Son of God His life, and He willingly laid it down. So, But from an eternal perspective, choosing to be faithful to God is the best and most obvious choice. So Paul preached, he was persecuted, and then finally Paul was sent away to Berea and he preached there. Look at verse number 10. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night. Now he's not cowering, he's not compromising, he's not running. If he stays there, he's obviously going to be arrested and die. But note here, verse 10, Berea, when he gets there, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. So the new believers sent them away. And upon arrival, they didn't go to the beach at Berea and sip pina coladas. They didn't go and put their feet up and lay by the pool. They didn't get in their boat. And again, so many things that perhaps they needed a break. They needed some R&R. We've all been kind of trapped in our home. That doesn't mean that it's relaxing. We need some R&R, don't, don't we? We need the mountains or the beach or whatever. It's the campgrounds. We need something. Well, Paul and Silas knew that their lives were short, so upon arrival they went straight back to the place where they knew it would be most effective. So what an important lesson. Even though they were attacked, accused, and forced to leave because of the Jews, they went into the synagogue to preach. So the most difficult places and the most difficult experiences should not deter us from following the Lord and continuing the ministry of sharing the gospel or of the ministry of evangelism. The point is they were faithful. They were faithful. Um, we all have a loved one that doesn't know the Lord or that may not, um, they may not have responded yet after 15, 10, 19, 20, 30 years. But the gospel is the seed that is sown and that as it is sown, it doesn't return void. Sometimes it is outright rejected. Sometimes, as Jesus said, He talks about it. But sometimes it will take root and the Holy Spirit of God will use His Word to kind of germinate. It can. It, it's something so miraculous that only God can bring life from death. We were dead in our trespasses and sins, and it's the gospel that can, can bring life to us. So what's our application and some reflection here? Think about it this week. What actions can we take that would be a good first step in being faithful or staying faithful, getting back on course, getting back out of the ditch? We've spun out because of some black ice, or maybe we thought we'd take a shortcut. There are no shortcuts to holiness. There are no shortcuts. So the point is we should deliver the mail in good weather and bad. It's hurricane season on top of all this. Isn't that great? <laughs> Woohoo! Uh, murder hornets, you know. Uh, the plagues of Egypt are unleashed upon America, whatever it might be. Um, all of this stuff. Well, the good news has to go on. Uh, the badder the bad news is, the gooder the good news becomes. Think about that. That's a, we, there's some bad news, good night, but in, in the soil of bad news, the seed of the good news of the gospel can truly grow. And that's our verse, Psalm 36, 5. Thy mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens, and thy faithfulness reacheth unto the clouds. God is faithful to us, even though we are so discouraged by what we see, not just in our world, not just in our city, but how about even in our churches? Christians, we get let down. We let down each other. The Lord will never let us down. He will never let us down, and His Word will never change. No matter how much the world says this book doesn't mean anything, 
There is no heaven. There is no hell. There is no judgment. This is it. This is what we got. If we can put our faith and trust in this, the badder the bad news is, the gooder the good news becomes. And the good news is that the gospel still works. Jesus is still on the throne. And he's coming soon. We need to be ready. 